you, Kevin, sitting at the same table today. This has been very confusing. Okay, so um, Kevin Gerfin retired from the Air Force after 21 years of service, uh, both with an enlisted and as an officer career. He retired as a major. Uh, we've been neighbors for 22 years. He lives right across the way from me. I don't, don't remember this or not. The first time we met, I'd been at the house a little over a year, a little over a month, and we had a real heavy snowfall. And I was out with my snowblower because I came from Wisconsin. I was pushing snow around, and he had a party that night. And he came and asked me. He offered to pay me to clear his driveway for his party. And I said, no, 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 I'm out here having fun. I, I'm glad to do it for you. And uh, he, he did invite us to the, to the party, so, uh, but I didn't let him pay me. Anyway, he had, well, he had a number of jobs in the Air Force, but the coolest one, I think, was as a White House social aide. He's going to talk about that and talks about some other things, too. But Kevin Gerfin, come on up. There we go. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, indeed, I do remember that. If you had not said that story, I was going to say, because I remember that, that that was a very good Im first impression for meeting my new neighbor that you sh sh cleared my driveway of the snow for free, in which I appreciate it very much. Um, I'll clear up something quickly, because I, I get this a lot. If I look familiar, but you can't quite place me, you may have seen me at Town & Gown. I've done 15 shows out of Town & Gown, and I... I can't encounter that frequently. <laughs> That's where I know him. Yes. I'm here to talk about the White House Social Aid Program. The White House Social Aid Program was started in 1902 by President Teddy Roosevelt when he needed some additional help beyond his staff members to help with events at the White House. So he, he turned to the military and says, can you provide some officers to come and help? So the program has been in existence since 1902. Um, but the, uh, I served as a White House social aide from summer of 1991 to summer of 1994. And I've got a brief video to play for you. Uh, this was after the, um, this was a, a video clip about 30 seconds long from the television show Entertainment Tonight. And it showed me on a microphone uh, introducing uh, the guests, at least the American guests, uh, to the uh, President, First Lady, and the Emperor and Empress of Japan. For This is a state dinner for the Emperor and Empress of Japan in June of 1994. The Japanese guests, by the way, were introduced by an interpreter hired by the State Department. So I did not have to worry about the Japanese names. Thank you. Uh, but I did introduce all the guests. And the, 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 the video clip that you will see is of me introducing Barbara Streisand and her date, Peter Jennings, the anchor of ABC Evening News. Uh, for this particular receiving line. And this same video clip was used the next evening on all three major networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and I think PBS. Um, um, and two of them used my voice on television, introducing Miss Barbara Streisand and Mr. Peter Jennings, and the other two did not just, uh, the, the anchor talked over me, but I'll play the video for you now. Hi there, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mary Hart. And I'm John Tesh. Amid all the hoopla in Washington last night at the White House State Dinner for the Emperor of Japan was one couple who had heads turning throughout the evening. Ms. Barbara Streisand and Mr. Peter Jennings. There for all the world to see were Barbara Streisand with no less than ABC anchor Peter Jennings as her escort. No word on whether the recently separated newsman and the pop diva are playing beautiful music together, or if they're just catching up on the latest geopolitical ongoings in Kazakhstan. But for last night, at least, Peter and Barbara were an item. If you notice a faint smile on my face when they were walking up, it's because I remember thinking, I don't need a card. I know who these people are. <laughs> But I was also responsible for introducing all the Americans who were guests at that event, and some, some of them I knew, some of them I did not. So it did help to have those, those cards. But I'm going to talk about the White House Social Aid Program in which I served there for three years. Uh, social aides are assistants to the presidents and fir first lady. Uh, we are their representative to the guests at White House events. And the White House events are very varied 
and I will talk about a few of those, but it's non-political duty. Um, I will mention I have a couple of weird souvenirs. Uh, if you'll notice in my left hand on this image you, that you see there, there's a, there's a water cup. That is Bill Clinton's water cup. Uh, it's one of my two weird souvenirs. It was an event after the Boys Nation had been invited to the White House in an event at the Rose Garden. The Rose Garden is right outside the Oval Office. And um, it was a hot summer day. And President Clinton turned to me and said, would you get me a cup of water? And of course, I ushered, mentioned, motioned to one of the ushers to bring a cup of water for him. I handed it off to him. He took his drink. He gave it back to me. I held on to the cup. I still have that cup to this day. I have Bill Clinton's <laughs> water cup. I have another weird souvenir I'll tell you about later. If, you'll remind, if I forget, just say so. I um, uh, was there for three years, uh, the last 18 months of the George Herbert Walker and Barbara Bush White House, and the first 18 months of the Bill and Hillary Clinton White House. Worked about 75 events of a variety of different types. Uh, the most prestigious are the state dinners, the White House dinners, and the inauguration ceremony, which is at the state capitol, or at the U.S. Capitol, and then several other different events I'll describe. Uh, duties that we perform, uh, a, a number of duties assigned to social aides, but the most prestigious duty for a social aide is to run the president's or the first lady's receiving lines. We do work some events without the president, some they're just hosted by the first lady, uh, but we will run their receiving lines and you do a variety of different uh, uh, duties for that. In this pic picture you see here, I'm standing uh, uh, in about ready to give a name to first lady Clinton, Hillary Clinton. Uh, this was for a state dinner for the president of South Korea in 1993. The person that you see to the right, the man in the tuxedo, that is the president of South Korea. And if you notice there's some, some hair, another gentleman standing behind the president of South Korea, that is his Korean Secret Service agent. They call it something different than Secret Service, but it's a, the equivalent of the Korean Secret Service agent whose duty was to protect the president of South Korea. My job was to whisper into the first lady's ear the name of each guest as he or she came up so she could greet that guest by name. Hi, Susie. Hi, Bill. Hi, Linda. Uh, but I had to get the name from a relay aide who listened in when it was whispered in President Clinton's ear and then, then stepped between the president of South Korea and his Korean Secret Service agent to give it to me so that I could give it to the first lady. I would be in trouble if I didn't have that name because she relied on me to give her the name of each guest as they came up. Well, um, if looks could kill, I would have died that day because the, the Secret Service fellow from South Korea was very, very unhappy with me because I was stepping between him and the guy he had sworn his life to, to protect uh, each time because I had to get the name of each guest from the relay aide who was listening in when was, the name was given to the president. After a while, he finally realized I wasn't going to knife the president of South Korea and he, and he calmed down. But for a while, it was kind of tense because he was not happy with me because I was constantly stepping between him and the guy he was supposed to protect. But I was, uh, my job with him was to be the whisper aide for the first lady. First lady, I have some other pictures of me uh, being an, uh, an intro aide, which you saw on that video, and then the pull-off aide. And pull-off aide is a very interesting job, and I will demonstrate how to do that with a volunteer when we get to the time, if you'll remind me to do that. I also, um, when people come to the White House, they're always invited to come there with a guest. And most of them do arrive with a guest, but a few do not. And the very first event I ever worked, Jacqueline Smith arrived. It was a state dinner for the president of South Korea. This is during the, the, the Bush administration. And uh, Jacqueline Smith from the TV show Charlie's Angels arrived without, a, without an escort, without a date. We don't allow that. If, we, if somebody arrives without an escort, without a date, we assign a social aide to be that guest's uh, uh, escort for the evening. You also, you, uh, something else to explain to you is that your first three events that you work, you are under probation because it's the first three events you work. You've gone through the selection process, you've gone through the security clearance process, you've been issued your White House pass, and you go and you work your first three events and you're on probation. So I was still on probation for my very first ever, ever event when uh, the senior aide in charge of that event said, Jacqueline Smith is going to be here. She doesn't have a, an escort. You will be her escape, escort for the evening. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I had watched Charlie's Angels back in the 1970s. I knew who Farrah Fawcett Majors was. I knew who Kate Jackson was. I knew who Jacqueline Smith was. And it's my very first ever event. And rather than just be assigned to one of the entrances just to greet everybody as they came in, which was typical, I was assigned to be Jacqueline Smith's escort for the evening. I thought, this is so cool. This is so cool. It lasted 15 minutes because a, se a more senior aide than me, a, a, a Marine Corps major who was senior to me in rank because I was a captain in the Air Force at the time, and he was senior to me in the White House Social Aid Program, just threw a fit with the senior aide who made all the assignments and kept at it and kept at it. And after finally 50, about 15 minutes, the, the, the senior aide in charge of all the assignments finally relented and told this Marine Corps major, OK, fine, you can go and relieve him. Because he was saying, why does he get to, to escort her? It's his first event ever. And by the way, I outrank him. Why does he get to do this? And so after about 15 minutes, this Marine Corps major came and relieved me. I said, yes, sir. And so he took over from that point. But for 15 minutes, on the very first event I ever worked, a state dinner for the president of South Korea in summer of 1991, I got to escort Jacqueline Smith to be her date for the evening. I also escorted some other VIPs uh, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was being announced to the country as the nominee uh, for the Supreme Court. I escorted her. I also escorted Stephen Sondheim once uh, when he came in. Uh, start with simple tasks. You, mostly, you, the first few events, you'll just be greeting people at the entrance, welcoming them to the White House, show them to, directing them toward the, the coat check room if it's a winter event, things like that. And you help with crowd control. You work your way up into more senior assignments like working the receiving lines. The receiving line, as I mentioned, is the most prestigious duty you get to work. And the closer you are to the principals, the more senior aid you are. And occasionally you get assigned a, a, to a shadow, a principal, and I've got a picture of me shadowing Mrs. Uh, Bush at one point. And you help the Secret Service move the president and the first lady uh, through a crowd as needed. Um, and uh, you also perform wallflower patrol duty. Wallflower patrol duty is one of my favorite things to do. I volunteered to do that. I'll give you a brief um, rundown on that. Some people get invited to an event at the White House, like a state dinner or a White House dinner, which are similar but different, because a state dinner involves a foreign head of state. And it's paid for by the State Department. And by the way, the State Department pays to feed us social aides during state dinners. But the White House doesn't do it. We're on our own. While everybody else is eating, we're on our own. But this, we like state dinners because the State Department paid to feed us. Um, but people will get invited to these events. Sometimes they have absolutely no idea why they were invited to this event, and they're terrified. Because they're, they're going to be at an event with mem members of Hollywood, senior business executives, you know, the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Defense, and, and senators and Congress people and people like that, and members of the pre Supreme Court. And they're terrified. Uh, they get in, uh, an invitation will show up in the mail inviting you on this day, this time, to come and have dinner with the President First Lady and maybe the, the President of Germany or Boris Yeltsin, President Boris Yeltsin of, of Russia or whatever. And they will, they will show up, but they are afraid to interact with the other guests at the event. We call them wallflowers because they're afraid to interact with the other guests at the event. If you uh, choose to take on wallflower patrol duty, and I did that a lot, in order to do it well, you need to know something about some historical events, know something about the painting or something that happened in this room, wherever you happen to encounter wallflowers so you can speak to them. And it is your job to be proactive, to go up and speak to them, get their name, introduce yourself, and say, let me tell you about these candlesticks that to John Adams, let me tell you about this painting above the fireplace that was found, bought in India in the 1950s. It was dirty and it rolled up and paid for about ten, bought for about 10 bucks, and now it's hanging above the fireplace here in the green room, or some other things like that. But in order to do that well, you need to know some things about the White House. And so while I was a social aide, I wrote, I compiled, I compiled uh, uh, a White House history notes with information that I found interesting on all the different rooms where I could encounter uh, a guest. So I would know what to say, have something interesting to talk to them about. And then you would uh, make this, in, you would, like I said, uh, get their name, and you hope to put them at ease by, by just, just conversing with them. 
And then you start walking them over, you hope rather imperceptibly, thank you, you start walking them over to another clump of people. It could be the chairman of Boeing or the chairman of Xerox and, and the Secretary of the Treasury and, and a U.S. Senator, and you say, may I present Bill and Linda Smith, uh, Smith from Topeka, Kansas? And they are savvy enough to know to say, well, hi, Bill. Hi, Linda. How are you? Nice to meet you. Come on in. Let's talk. That kind of thing. And you go off and look for other wallflowers. Wallflowers were always easy to spot because they would be afraid to interact with everybody else. They would usually spend an inordinate amount of time looking out the window, one of the windows and looking out toward the South Lawn, toward the Washington Monument or something like that, because they were scared to death to interact with the people over here that they see on television almost on a daily basis. And so you go set them at ease, get their name, give them your name, walk and try to put them at ease and then walk them over and introduce them to other other people, and then you go off and look for other wallflowers. That is wallflower patrol. Okay, here I was pull off aid to Mrs. Clinton. Um, the uh, pull off aids are taught to stand one full step away from the last person in the receiving line. And in this case, it happened to be the first lady. You stand one full step away from the last person in the receiving line because that gives you room to move over. If a guest is holding up the line, it is your job as a social aide. You get to be the bad guy. It is your job to get the line moving because if that, uh, that we, we cannot allow the receiving line to get stuck by somebody who won't stop talking. Because everybody's got to go through the receiving line. They all get their picture taken. And so it is your job to be the bad guy. But they have these la the social aide who was doing the pull-up aid duty to be one full step away from the last person in the receiving line. And if somebody is holding up a line, you move over. And by moving over, you'll catch their attention. And you just stare at them until they make eye contact. And the instant they make eye contact, you do like this. And that is subtle, but it gets the point across, you need to go. You just stare at them until they make eye contact, and you do like this. <laughs> that is, that is, pull off eight. If I can get a volunteer, a lady preferably, okay, come. Uh, Mrs. Bush was the easiest person in the world for whom a social aid could do uh, pull off aid duty because all we had to do was stand there and watch. She um, um, had this down to a science. Now, keep in mind that when I started working there is in summer of 1991, so she had been first lady for two and a half years at that point, and, by, and before that, she had been the vice president's spouse for eight years before that. And she knew how to keep a receiving line moving along, so if you will come over here, and you will be the guest. Now, every person who comes up will get a uh, picture taken with, by the official White House photographer, and she will greet, she'll grab you by your hand, and I've got to touch you, if that's okay. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, touch I mean, just here. No. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Understand. She would touch, and, and she would put her hand right here. And right and the there small, small, And she would smile for the camera, and go click, and as soon as the picture was, was taken, she would pull with this hand, and she would push <laughs> with that hand, and you're gone. <laughs> So being the, so the pull-off aide for, for Mrs. Bush was the easiest job in the world because all we had to do was just stand there and watch. Because as soon as the picture would click, she goes, hi, thanks for coming, Cl pull, push. <laughs> and that guest was gone. We are not Secret Service agents. Everybody who's served in the military has probably gotten a POP briefing, a Protection of the President briefing, in which you're told if it comes to that, yeah, you lay your life on the line for the President. But generally speaking, they don't want us interfering. If the bullets start flying, the instructions are hit the floor or paste yourself against the wall and stay out of the way unless they ask for your help. If they ask for your help, then you help. But, other, but, in, in, but if there's a, a threat to the principal, president, first lady, vice president, vice president's spouse, then your job is to get out of their way unless they ask you for help. We don't work there, full, social aides do not work there full time. We are all volunteers. All social aides are volunteers. We do this duty in addition to our other military jobs. Um, but uh, there is a military, a full-time uh, military officer from each of the services in the White House in the military office, and they do travel with the president, and they carry the football, which is the 40-pound uh, bag, may not weigh 40 pounds anymore, but a, a, a large suitcase with all the nuclear launch codes. So we're, we're not the, the people who carry the nuclear launch coach, codes, and we don't work there full-time. We do this duty in addition to our other service in the, if, for me, for the Air Force. I was an intelligence officer for 13 and a half years of my 21 years 
in the Air Force. And uh, we do this in addition to our other Air Force jobs. Typical events, state dinners, uh, we're at nine state dinners. Like I said, the, uh, we liked them because the State Department paid to feed us. We would, while everybody else was in the state dining room having dinner, we would go downstairs to the, the, the White House mess, which is run by the United States Navy. And the United States Navy would feed us a really nice meal. It wasn't necessarily the same food they were eating upstairs, but it was very, very nice food. But if it was a White House dinner, we were on our own. And so we would send a social aid to Old Ebbett Grill, which is across the street from, uh, uh, from the Treasury Department, and have them arrange to like, hold a table for like 35 or 40 of us. And as soon as um, uh, the last guest went into the state dining room, we would go downstairs, change out of our inside the White House shoes into street shoes, and then head over to Old Ebbett Grill, get something to eat quickly, come back, uh, change into our inside the White House shoes, brush your teeth, go back upstairs, and be ready for them to open the doors f at the end of the state dinner before for the state for the uh, uh, post dinner entertainment. Um, but uh, otherwise, they were they were quite simple, uh, quite similar. But the um, White House dinners were, were for a variety of different things. They were recognition. Uh, sometimes they were thanks to political donors, and I worked out for both parties. Uh, and we actually did have one practice dinner, but we were threatened with a hanging if we s revealed to anybody that the guests there for that evening were there for a practice dinner. But it turned out they all knew it. And the one who told me was Bob Costas, because I was speaking with Bob Costas at the end of that event. Um, and uh, they, he and his wife were among the last to leave. I was speaking to him in the cross hall outside the Blue Room. And he, he mentioned, oh, yeah, we all know this is a practice dinner. And I said, well, we were threatened with you know, being fired if we ever mentioned anybody. That you're, by the way, you're just here for a practice dinner. Because this was the first state dinner in the um, um, Clinton administration. And they wanted to make sure that the state dinner went right. So about a week to 10 days beforehand, they had a practice dinner, at which Bob Costas was, was invited. But we also worked receptions, bill signing ceremonies, treaty signing ceremonies, first lady teas, breakfast, and things like that. Uh, this picture that you see in the upper right is from the uh, uh, state dinner for the emperor, emperor and empress of Japan. Um, one of the things that meant most to me was working a Medal of Honor ceremony. Uh, two, two people were awarded, or their families were given, the uh, uh, Medal of Honor for uh, a couple of people who, in the Army who, who earned that distinction. I also got to work the presidential inauguration. By the time President Clinton's inauguration came along, I was very good friends with uh, the senior aide who made all the assignments, and he gave me the plum assignment. I got to escort all the incoming administration senior officials to the inner platform. There's an inner platform on the inaugural platform, and there's an outer platform. The inner platform is for the higher ranking people, and I got to escort all the guests who were at the uh, inner platform to their seats before the program started and I was on television a lot. My parents were watching the TV at home, watching the inauguration to look for me. And um, uh, I got to invite really, I escort really everybody except the incoming president, first lady, and, and the incoming vice president and vice president's spouse. But everybody else, I got to escort them to their seats. Um, diplomatic events, uh, all kinds of different things, arrival events. When you have a state dinner earlier in the day when the um, uh, state dinner is going to happen, there is a big formal arrival ceremony with the Drum and Fife Corps dressed up in 1776 uniforms and the Drum and Bugle Corps and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and it's a very nice event. But one of those did not go well. This did not involve me, but a, the White House social secretary got fired over that arrival event because it involved uh, Queen Elizabeth II and somebody forgot to provide a step stool on which she could stand when she was behind the podium after the president welcomed her. And from the perspective of the, the press and therefore the television cameras, when you saw the, the Queen of England, all you saw was a hat <laughs> above the, the, uh, the presidential seal. You didn't get to see her face because somebody forgot to provide uh, something for her to stand on to raise her up so she could be seen, and the social secretary got fired over that. I worked treaty signing ceremonies, bill signing ceremonies. Here I'm working a, a, a treaty signing ceremony. This is me in the white uniform. Uh, the Air Force does, did, no longer does, uh, did have a white ceremonial uniform, which is for daytime summer events. Uh, and uh, so I had to buy that uniform. 
um, worked balls and receptions and rose garden events and barbecues and such. Ceremonial events, I worked two Supreme Court justice swearing in ceremonies, I worked uh, um, recognition ceremonies of a variety of different kinds that you can see on this list, including for the Olympic team. When John Smith won a gold medal in 1992 Olympics, uh, and Kenny Munya did too, uh, the Olympic team was invited to the White House for a big uh, South Lawn barbecue. And an unforecast heavy thunderstorm just popped up out of nowhere. And suddenly, and the White House was not set up inside for this event. It was going to be outside. And this event, the, this, this storm came along very much unexpected. So everybody except the president, first lady, vice president, vice president's spouse, and their secret service detail. Everybody else was grabbing stuff off the South Lawn and hauling it in to the White House, including me. All of us did. And the guests. And so what we ended up doing was having a, a picnic inside the White House where people just sat on the floor. And that's how it is that, uh, that Kenny Mundy and, and John Smith and others were sitting on the floor at this event uh, inside the White House because it was storming outside and an electrical storm, things like that. Um, worked the, uh, like I said, the Boys Nation reception in the Rose Garden, did reception for the Super Bowl champs, things like that. And um, it, in this one case you see in the lower left, sort of escorting Stephen Sondheim for a, a, medal, a presidential arts medal in October of 1993. I met Ruth Bader Ginsburg and she brought her mom. I met her at the entrance to the diplomatic reception room, uh, which is the large oval room on the ground floor on the south side and met them and es brought them upstairs, escorted them upstairs to meet President Clinton where uh, she was to be introduced as the, the nominee back in June of 1993. Highlights, the state dinners, the White House dinners, the inauguration, Congressional Medal of Honor ceremony. Worked a Veterans Day breakfast on Veterans Day, there'd be a, a breakfast at the White House for members of the military. And that was always very nice and very meaningful. Um, did work a private working dinner, which honestly, I'm not sure why I was there, because this was just President Clinton, Vice President Gore, I think the Secretary of State, and the National Security Advisor, just four Americans and four members of the new resident of 10, number 10 Downing Street, ta-da, number 10 Downing Street, uh, John Major at the time, and his equivalent of our uh, Vice President, National Security Advisor, and Secretary of State. Um, and quite frankly, we really didn't have anything to do. So the social aid, I was in charge of that event. I was a senior aide for that event. And I had two social aides working for me at that particular thing. And once we got them all herded into the red room and they closed the door and they had their little conversation, mostly we just hung around with the Secret Service out, out in the uh, cross hall and just gossiped, quite frankly. Um, did work a couple of events outside the confines of the White House, beside, in, in addition to the inauguration in January 1993. Um, there, is, there was a large uh, reception for the top donors to the Holocaust Museum. The Holocaust Museum was opened during the Clinton administration, and uh, uh, the, so the, the top donors to that were hosted at a private reception at Blair House. If you're familiar with Blair House, it's across the street and down about half a block from the White House. And that is the official guest residence of, the, of the, the president. So if somebody is not invited to stay inside the White House, maybe up on the residence floor, but is invited to stay in, in DC, they will put them up at Blair House. And by the way, Blair House is the place where Harry Truman and Bess Truman lived for the couple of three years that the White House was completely gutted and rebuilt back in the early 1950s. But that's where they stayed. And that's the po point, by the way, where he was living when an attempt on Harry Truman's life occurred, somebody tried to assassinate, well, a group of people tried to assass assassinate Harry Truman at that point while he was living at Blair House. Okay, I had a couple of occasions to go up on the private residence floor, which was quite a treat, because generally speaking, that was absolutely off limits, absolutely very well done. But once during the uh, um, um, uh, Bush administration, and then a couple of times during the Clinton administration, I got to go up, and because I was asked to take people up to see things uh, like the, the a, a handwritten copy of the Emancipation Proclamation is uh, written out, it's under glass on a uh, desk uh, in the, in the um, uh, Lincoln bedroom upstairs. And some people guests wanted to see that, so Mrs. Barbara, Mrs. Bush said, sir, but you didn't say, she didn't say sir, she, would, you, would you take them up? And I said, yes, ma'am, I would. So I took them up. So a few times had got to go up to the private residence floor, but that was pretty unusual pretty unusual, and then worked the Supreme Court justice swearing in ceremonies. Um, this picture, picture in the lower right is the, when I'm wearing that white uniform, 
That again is a, is a summer daytime event, and that's where I'm wearing, why I'm wearing the white uniform, but that's for the Medal of Honor ceremony for Master Sergeant Gordon and, and Sergeant First Class Schubert. Uh, benefits of the job. Uh, if you work there at least one year and you leave in good graces, and I worked there for three, but if you work there at least one year and you leave in good graces, you get a photograph of the president at the end of your duty, and you get a presidential service pin, which I am wearing here. Um, the, uh, before President Clinton came along, and there was nothing wrong with this, nothing wrong with this, but before President Clinton came along, uh, a, an, an aide would just let the president know, this is Major so-and-so's or Captain so-and-so's or Lieutenant so-and-so's last event, so we need to get a picture with you, with him or her. And they would do that. And it could be by the staircase, it could be on the South Lawn, it could be in the Rose Garden, it could be in the Blue Room, it could be just any one of a number of different places, but you'd get a nice photograph with you and the president. And that was nice. There's nothing wrong with that. The one thing President Clinton instituted, which we all appreciated, is that once a month, uh, they would have all the military members who were leaving the president's service, and that could be on Air Force One, could be on Air Force Two also, by the way, and uh, flying the First Lady around, uh, and, and, um, and any of the Marine Guards who opened the doors at the West Wing and things like that. But all the military people who, who, who immediately serve the president, including like Marine One, the helicopter, um, you would, they would gather us in the, uh, either the Roosevelt Room or the cabinet room, and you would go into the Oval Office one at a time, and you got a one-minute appointment with the president in the Oval Office for your going-away photo, which was nice. Uh, uh, and so this picture you see here in the upper right, uh, this again, this is my going-away photo with President Clinton in the Oval Office right when I uh, left the program. Um, we also, social aides wear this igulet, which is this, we call it a rope, on your right shoulder. Aides of the president wear that on your right shoulder. If you're an aide to the vice president, secretary of defense, secretary of the air force, or a general officer, you will wear it on the left shoulder, but the only aides of the president get to wear the aiguillette on your right shoulder. Um, you get an annual photo with the president and the first lady uh, with all the social aides, a big group photo, and a variety of different candid photos like you see here, and here is one occasion where I was Mrs. Bush's pull-off aide, that's down in the map room. Uh, and you get a Christmas card from them every year, and you find yourself on television occasionally. Uh, so some of the benefits of the job are as listed here. We also, we were issued a White House pass, and at, every year at Christmas time, we could bring one guest to a specific, on the specific evening set aside for this. And all the social aides could bring their date to the, so to the White House and tour the White House, and you could give them to tour yourself and uh, uh, show them all the White House Christmas decorations every year at Christmas, which was nice. As sa similarly, in the summer, on the 4th of July, you could bring a blanket and bring a date, and you could go into the White House and you could watch the Washington, D.C. fireworks from the south lawn of the White House. It was safe in there. Uh, they had access to bathrooms. They provided the ice cream, and you just spread your blanket out on the south lawn, you watch the fireworks. It was a nice thing to do. Um, if you've ever driven around Washington, D.C., oh man, I gotta hurry up. Uh, driven around Washington, D.C., um, you notice there's hardly any place to park in, D in daytime. So if we worked a daytime event, they assigned us to work in the White House parking garage, which is a nondescript building about a mile or so north of the White House, and you would never know it's a White House parking garage. But it's operated by the United States Army, senior NCOs from the United States Army. And you go in there, and they will drive you from the White House parking garage in a White House limousine to the White House and drop you off at the east entrance. Now, this is not the beast. It's not the same vehicle in which the president travels, but it is an official White House limousine with secure telephones. In fact, if I wanted to call up my office and speak work stuff, I could have because these were secure telephones. Uh, but they would drive you to the White House in, in a White House limo, drop you off, and at the end of the, end of the event, they'd come pick you up, put your clothing bag in the trunk, close the door for you, drive you back to the parking garage. It was kind of cool. It was a perk. Um, you get to take your family and events, uh, friends on, on tours. Uh, certain days of the week, at a certain time of day, you could bring up to six guests on your White House pass and give them a tour of the White House yourself. Uh, World-class entertainment. At the receptions, 
were wonderful when I was there in the White House. This was high quality food and really high quality liquor, even though I'm not much of a drinker, but this was the good stuff, not the cheap stuff. And at the, when the last, we could not have, we social aides could not have a thing while the event was going on. But as soon as the last guest left, we could just swarm the table in the state dining room. And this was world class food. And we made, I made dinner, all of us did, made supper out of that many times because we just did great shrimp and, and cuts of beef and things like like that and drinks and such of that, it was great food. And you could have, it, the fact that you did this duty could be put in your officer performance reports, things like that, and you got to go places and meet people and do things that most people never get a chance to do. You get to be a personal hit, hit, uh, witness to history and be in close personal contact with all these movers and shakers. Um, here I was Mrs. Bush's guest, you notice I'm not wearing the aiguillette because I am a guest. I had made an, an ornament for the White House Christmas tree. And the thing was, if you made an ornament for the White House Christmas tree that year, sometime during the summer, and I, my, my, my then girlfriend, now wife, taught me how to do this. It was, was it needlepoint? I think it was needlepoint. She t and I made a little Scotty dog uh, that was hung on the White House Christmas tree. And everybody who made an ornament for the White, White House Christmas tree got invited as a guest. So all those social aides had to be nice to me because I was a guest. But that's, that's my official photo with Mrs. Bush. Uh, drawbacks, you're working two jobs and you might have some resentment from your co-workers and I did have one captain in particular who was constantly complaining that I guess I'll have to do that because Kevin will be at the White House and that was never true because I always made sure that if I came in on weekends or I stayed late at night, I always got all my work done and no one would have to do duty that I ordinarily would have done and uh, just because I was gone. And you may well get home way after, way after dark um, from these events. And you don't get a performance report out of the White House, but the fact that you do this duty can be in, in pro officer promotion recommendations and things like that, and it does help. You do spend a lot of money on uniforms. You buy some additional uniforms that most military officers are not required necessarily to have, uh, but you'll do it willingly because you want to do this duty. The selection process on this is quite difficult, uh, and you don't get any other financial help. Don't say anything that could embarrass the president and the first lady. You don't get yourself involved in a policy discussion. You, you can't accept an invitation. If somebody inside the White House says, we're going to X bar or X restaurant after this is over, you want to join us? You are required to decline. Required, you, you decline respect, respectfully, but you are required to decline. But if, it's, uh, but if you're outside the White House and they have asked you, you can go. But if they ask you inside, you can't. And you're not supposed to call any presidential aide by the first name, but I did once early in the Clinton administration. I was meeting George Stephanopoulos. He was, come, he was in the ground floor. I was coming from the east. He was coming from the west. We both met at the staircase to go upstairs to the state floor. I said, hi, George. And as soon as I said that, I thought, I called him by his first name. Uh, and I thought, if I don't get fired, I guess I'll be OK. And he just smiled at me with the big pearly whites and said, hi, hi how you doing? And scurried on up the stairs, and he left. So uh, that was fine. My last job, I'm, 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 last slide, I just put on there because I like it. My first job in the Air Force was doing in-flight refueling. I did that for four and one half years, flying the KC-135 tanker refueling plane, and I just like to put that picture out there. Okay, I think I'm done. I'm sorry I went so long. We have time for one question. Okay. Anybody has one question? Yes. Did you ever have a sign on? No, sir. That was the one question. <laughs> yeah. Things for you to look at if you want to see them. Kevin, first of all, we.